everyone. Great to talk to you again. I hope you're well. This is Red Ice Radio. I'm Henrik, your host. Thank you for tuning in today. RedIceCreations.com is our website where you will find more radio programs, regular news updates, and much more. Today we are talking with Daniel Estelin, who's back on the program. He is an investigative journalist, researcher, author, and the host of a show on RT Latin America. He has given two speeches at the European Parliament on the Bilderberg Group and the International Monetary Crisis. Today we are going to talk about his latest book, Transevolution, The Coming Age of Human Deconstruction. Transevolution asserts that the depth of progress and technological development is such that people in the very near future will no longer be human, but something else. Then it will explain how transevolution and the rise of a new kind of human being fits perfectly with the plans of the super elite. Welcome back, Daniel. Thank you so much for uh, talking with us again. Hope you've been uh, well since we last spoke. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for having me on your show again. You bet, you bet. Very interesting topic. We've been following the specifics of transhumanism for uh, well, for for years now, really. There, there's just an extraordinary amount every day surrounding the, the, the developments in, in this particular field that is happening uh, that we could talk about. Obviously, you've written a whole book about it called Trans Evolution. Tell us a little bit about the background, Daniel, and kind of where you and when, I guess, you picked up the trail on, on, on this particular field. Actually, it started a long time ago, um, about 2005, <coughs> Bilderberg Conference uh, in uh, Germany, Rotterdam. Um, I got from one of my sources at the conference a part of uh, what later became a uh, secret source document on the future of humanity called Strategic Trends Report 2007-2036. It's a blueprint for the uh, future strategic national requirements of the entire world. And uh, about 30, I think, seven pages of what eventually turned into a 91-page report was given to me by my sources at the uh, 2005 Bilderberg Conference. And I was reading that. And even though it wasn't the full report, it was just a third of what you know turned into a 91-page report, I realized that we're looking at some of the greatest evolutionary changes you know, to come in the history of mankind. And later over the years, uh, combined with other reports and conferences such as the Age of Transition, Global, Global Futures um, 2045 uh, International Congress, NBIC Conference, I realized you know, what these people are looking at you know, the idea of integrating humanity with technology and the visions that they laid out in uh, uh, these conferences and these reports included things like robotics, cybernetics, artificial intelligence, uh, life extensions, brain enhancement, brain-to-brain interaction, virtual reality, genetic engineering, teleportation, human-machine interfaces, new morphic engineering, enhanced human capabilities for defense purposes, and... Uh, you know, uh, when you're looking at all of these elements, uh, I came to realize when I finally sat down to write the book that literally what we're looking at is uh, we're standing at the cusp of the greatest evolutionary change in the history of mankind. People don't even understand how over the next very, very few years, three to five years from now, the world that we live in will not be anything like the world we are accustomed to seeing. And when you combine that with things such as uh, synthetic biology, which is literally changing our DNA as a result of a genetically modified crop, I came to realize that the generation of our children is, you know, the kids who are today are 15, 20 years old, are the last truly human generation of human beings on the planet. Their children, in other words, my grandchildren, they will be transhuman children. They may be post-human children. They will, you know, be man-machines or cyborg children. They'll be beings who are not totally human, but they certainly will not be human beings as you and I understand the definition of humanity. Well, it sounds like a nightmare uh, to me, Daniel. The more, the more I'm, I'm thinking about these these topics and and the the advancement of robotics and in in what direction we're moving. And it seems to me so far, in a way, that the technology has been very it's very, very intrusive. The body has a tendency to throw these things out. You know, we have to take drugs, for example, just to so, our, so that our body won't reject the implants or, or you know, even if it's uh, secondary bionic, you know, uh, implementations in the body and everything else. What kind of species do you think that we'll develop into if this if this actually if this succeeds and if this goes into full full force? I mean, it's a, a, a medicated, you know, uh, from cradle to grave kind of managed entity, or what? What is it going to be like? 
You know, it's uh, it's what well, I'm sure what it's not going to be. Somebody said to me the other day, so we're we gonna look like uh, uh, these people, you know, in in the first uh, um, uh, first um, film Star Wars series, no, back in 1977. You know, when one when, you know these characters walk into a bar and you have. I don't know all these people from you know all over the galaxy. I said I don't think we're going to look like that. Right. I don't know what it's going to be like because again the difference between Bilderberg, you know, which is, was my first book, and this is in Bilderberg was all easy. You know, we found out who the bad guys were, what they did, who they did it to whom, and how it was done. And suddenly these they had a face and a name and the deeds and the documents and you know and 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 their deliberations. That was easy. You finish the book, you close the book, you said ah, so this is a bad guy. But with this book. Trans evolution, the coming age of human deconstruction. Because we're dealing with, you know, the future, we're extrapolating what we know. But what we do know is that in the last 50 years, we have learned more than in the entire history of mankind. And in the next 20, we will have learned more than in these 50, which is more than the entire history of mankind. And it's going to get to a point about a generation and a half from now where, you know, we'll be doubling our knowledge all the time. But what is absolutely sure is that there's going to come a point where we will merge with this technology, whether we like it or not. And I think one of the dangers, you know, of this intrusive technology is that the people who are putting it together, and again, we're talking about, you know, the wealthiest 0.001% of the world's population because, uh, you know, it costs gazillions of dollars to develop such high-end technology. So, you know, if we're talking about brain-machine interfaces, which will allow control of machinery, you know, using the brain itself, implantable brain chips, all right? Uh, or if we're talking about uh, such things as being downloaded, you know, downloading your consciousness onto your computer, as Ray Kurzweil, the head of, you know, Google Tech predicts. Yeah. The whole thing about the, uh, as you said, just to pick up on what you were talking about, augmentations, they're a huge business, and they will be a huge business for the corporations. We already have, you know, cyborgs, uh, you know, the famous Oscar Pistorius, who became famous for winning a bronze medal, you know, when the Olympic Games in 2012, the Blade Runner, and then it became infamous when he killed his girlfriend, shot her through the head, I think, a hundred, you know, times. But the point is, is that these augmentations, they exist. Whether we're talking about, you know, uh, um, a heart which isn't ours, a bionic eye, you know, extensions, a body limbs. What we're doing is, you know, in the case of technology, these limbs, whether you're talking about limbs or implantable data chips, you know, into our bodies. This kind of stuff will give away enormous amounts of information to governments and corporations across the world. So my question is, you know, has it come to the point when we will be actively encouraged to exchange our perfectly functional body parts for upgraded technologies? I am absolutely convinced that that's going to be the case because the media, okay, will know how to maneuver and manipulate our, you know, ours into believing that this is the way to do it. But all this stuff ultimately comes at a price. We'll have to take the drugs. You know, and these drugs, uh, I need to make sure that augmentations work. They're dangerous drugs. They're addictive drugs. And they're expensive drugs. And if we don't take these drugs, absolutely the body will reject the augmentations. The elite, they will have their technology in us. They will have the power to turn off our limbs, the potential to turn off our eyes, you know, to turn off our hearts to our brains and send messages to our brains and control our thought as if these people had the power of God. So, you know, again, we're looking at extrapolating what we know into the very near future. And again, going back to the Strategic Trends Report, 2007-2036, by the time we get to 2036, if you read the report carefully and you see what it says, and these people don't make mistakes, 50% of the world's population over the next couple of years, years will be living in urban rather than rural areas. Population will have exploded to 10 billion people by 2036. We'll be talking about lack of food, water, medicine, proper hygiene, education, basic human necessities. And the elite in this report, you know, equated to collapse. Not only that, but they talk about, you know, the fact that there will be a growing gap between majority and a small number of highly visible super rich. And this gap, will pause an increasing threat to social order and stability. 
They discuss, you know, the possibility of civil war, intercommunal violence, insurgency, pervasive criminality, widespread disorder, collapse of the entire countries as a result of their, you know, uh, uh, globalized economy, economic breakdown. Yeah. And then to topple it off, they say as a result of this economic disintegration on the world stage, nations will become city states, omega cities of populations of 20 to 30 million people. And they themselves, these city-states or mega-cities, will collapse before the year 2035 as a result of, you know, unimaginable uh, population displacements and cities swelling to unimaginable proportions. So this is the panorama from here to one generation. Just think what can and will be done with technologies. So on the one hand, they're sending us to hell as a result of the, you know, uh, the, the, the destruction of the world's uh, economic base. But on the other hand, they're using their incredible technologies and incredible amount of money that they have to, you know, to, to make this divide between them and us even greater. Well, exactly. There's a number of points here of what you talked about that I want to pick up on. First thing, Strategic Trends Report. Do you know who produced this document that you're talking about and, and, and why should we listen to that? It's actually this document you can you can download it for free off of the internet. It's, it's called Strategic Trends Report 2007 2036. It's a 91 page report, which is a blueprint for UK's future strategic national requirements. But again, because I got it at Bilderberg, we know exactly where it came from. And the fact is that now it's available, and actually the latest version of this document is available, Strategic Trends Report 2010-2040, they're just extrapolating what we have already learned in the original report another four years. And again, if you combine that report with the other reports, such as the Age of Transition, as I said, NBIC, Global Future 2045, you suddenly understand how these people are integrating, merging humanity and technology, and what will become of us over the next generation. All right. Very interesting. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to link up those documents on them throughout the the European uh, you know, Commission, I believe it's uh, through or something. Yeah, European Commission. Nonetheless, what, what do you think drives this? I mean, that's really, if we go to the core of this, mankind has always developed different technologies, used them to his advantage. I mean, and, and, and where do you think that we should draw the line? If we think back into history, we can see that the implementation of certain steels gave an advantage you 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 know you had stronger swords you could win in battle it gave it gave you the upper upper hand to a certain extent that that is as much technology back then as as it is that we're still dealing with with right now it's still something conceived out of our minds and and you know wielded with either our hands or the machines that we cr we have created with our hands so well that that is changing because you know look in the 19th century was a century of the revolution of harnessing energy from fossil fuels, meaning oil. And the 20th century was about exploiting the power of data, which is, you know, information technologies. But this century is about controlling biology. So literally, in one of the great biggest, uh, you know, breakthroughs in recent history, scientists have created a synthetic genome that can self-replicate. What they've done is they've taken a cell and modified the genes of the cell by inserting DNA from another organism and so the bacteria replicated itself, thus creating a second generation of the synthetic gen DNA. And so basically what has happened is that this organism created by man in a laboratory will do exactly what mankind wants it to do. It will be under you know, the power of man. And so with, you know, with this technology has taken us you know, across a threshold. It's a turning point. That marks, you know, before and after of the way biology, and especially synthetic biology, which is founded on the ambition that one day, over the next couple of years max, we will be able to design a human being in a laboratory. And so for the first time in history, we will be able to create things, beings, not necessarily humans, who have never walked the face of the earth. So we're talking about, you know, synthetic genes that have been inserted into bacterium, which had its own original DNA stripped out, you know? So these DNA RNA substitutes have a name. They're called XNAs. And one notable property of these XNA molecules is they're not biodegradable. And so we're talking about, again, you know, this greatest evolutionary change. But there is, of course, you know, with any kind of a technology, 
yeah, you know, there's a pluses and the minuses. So, for example, you know, take children. If you have parents, they have an opportunity to genetically select, or I should say, elect their children, literally building their characteristics block by building block. And in the process, mankind will be creating a new breed of children, children that have never existed before in, man, you know, in the history of humanity. So the question is, are these still our children? Right. Or if they're not, who do they belong to? Yeah. So again, one of the things about this book is you, when you finish it, you have more you know, unsettling questions than you have answers. But there is another element, and it's a far darker element to consider. Imagine people like you and I, or parents who misbehave, criminals, dissidents, you know, those who think differently from the official party line of one world state. They could have their children's DNA altered during pregnancy as punishment for their non-obedience. Yeah. What's more, by altering DNA, the corporations and governments can create a society without memory. People whose life's experiences are stored in a memory drive running on a one-week cycle through modified DNA over and over and over and over again. And when you have that, you don't need schools. You don't need anything, history, geography. You don't need sciences because everything you do, you don't need photographs because you won't know who any of these people are because your life is stored on a disk running on a one-week cycle. That's the future. Well, again, it's it's a it's a nightmare future, you know, and, the, and and there's a number of things here as well along the way that seems to be happening to us. Also, we're we're with the with the current development of the technology that we have with synthetics and through uh, fossil fuels and all the chemicals and everything, we're de we're developing to a point where we're getting close to infertility. And I'm thinking about if they might want to try to combine uh, our our current and probably future problems with this particular technology as well as you just talked about, so that even the very production, the, the very, uh, you know, continuation of the human species is actually going to end up in the hands of, you know, corporations regulated by government eventually. And these creatures that they're going to, going to birth or clone or genetically alter or what have you is going to be under a completely different, you know, legal framework, basically, because they're not going to be children done in the conventional way, if you know what I'm getting at, Daniel. Oh, absolutely. This is definitely, a, you know, a possibility. And as far as, you know, if you're talking about reducing population, eugenics, this is exactly what you want to do. That's why genetically modified crop is there to do its bidding, you know, in places such as the Philippines, for example, have done tests, you know, using the Rockefeller Foundation money. And you have crop there, corn, which is actually created to make sure that women become non-fertile. But all of these, you know, ultimately, if you actually go to the, you know, to the, you know, the kernel of, 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 uh, of, of you know, the, 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 this, uh, I, not the psychology is not the word, you know, the philosophy, yeah. all right, that these people represent. And I'm talking about transhumanist movement. Transhumanism was born out of humanism, which is yet another clever disguise of scientism created specifically so that global eugenics operations could be carried out without being noticed. Epicyte is one of the corns that I know they developed as a, as a spermicide. Um, how, how far and, and what, what's the interface there, do you think, between our, our food supply and, and basically the, the artificial creation around our, even, our, our basic sustenance and, and how we you know, prolong our lives, basically? Well, you know, I don't think there's a better or cheaper way to reduce population than through, through starvation. And in order to starve people to death, you have to take control of their food production away from independent farmers and put it into the hands of giant corporations subservient to the interests of, of One World Company Limited. Okay, this isn't new. I mean, the use of food as weapon is a very ancient practice and can be found in at least 4,000 years ago in, in Mesopotamia. I mean, in ancient Greece, the cults of Apollo, Detimer, and others, they often controlled the shipping of grain and other foodstuffs you know, through a, a, uh, a temple system, you know, Imperial Rome, Venice, then, you know, the, the powerful Burgundian Duchy, the Dutch and British Livon companies, the East Indian companies, and also the West Indian companies, they all followed suit. And so today, food warfare is firmly under the control of just a few very powerful corporations. And what, again, people have to understand, okay, is that uh, this interlock self-perpetuating syndicate decides who eats and who doesn't eat, who lives and who dies. It is a virtual spider web of uh, financial, political, economic, and industry interests 
with a Venetian ultramontane fondy model at the center. So these people, they own and manage the affairs of an international, international interlocking corporate apparatus that dominates the choke points within the global economy, specifically finance, insurance, raw materials, transportation, and consumer goods. So, you know, one of the things about a trans evolution, you know, my, my, my latest book, is it's actually the first book out there in the world, just like Bilderberg was, you know, a one of a kind uh, when it first came out, is in this book, Trans Evolution, uh, that, you know, it's the first book that it puts on one plateau and explains in three dimensions, it creates a model, basically, of how technology, you know, transhumanism, singularity, you know, the, the concepts such as, you know, nano, nanotechnology, uh, space exploration, uh, synthetic biology, uh, the destruction of the world economy, money, uh, you know, a GMO, food in general, how all of these elements combine, you know, to create this perfect storm of content or discontent and the direction that the elite want to take us to. So I guess you would call this a roadmap for the very near future. And why do you use the word evolution, trans-evolution? Is it a, an evolutionary step or is it, is it an idea formulated by, again, a very, by a very few minds that the rest of us is, is kind of forced and drawn into at this point? It's very much an evolutionary step, absolutely. Again, if you go throughout history and you look how far we have come as far as uh, technological development, uh, you realize that you know, what, we're lo- what we're living through right now is, is just an intermediary pass. You know, you have trans-evolution, you're transhumanist, and then you have post-humanism. So you can talk about, you know, post-evolution. But just, you know, if, if you kind of go back about 100,000 years and look at technology, look how far we have come. 100,000 years ago, B.C., stone tools. Yep. 4,000 B.C., the wheel. 9th century A.D., gunpowder. Then in the 15th, 15th century, we had the printing press. Big game changer, just like Internet is today. 19th century, the light bulb. The 20th century, cars, television, nuclear weapons, spacecraft, internet, and now we come to the 21st century, biotech, nanotech, fusion, fission, space travel. Again, in the next 50 years, we'll be able to create cybernetic individuals who will be completely indistinguishable from people. Just think about it. I mean, television has only been around for 90 years. Yeah. Think how far into the future we have come. If, you know, if, if, if those of us who have a smartphone, that's about one in every seven people on the planet Earth, you know, this smartphone, be it Samsung, BlackBerry, you know, uh, Apple, it has more technology in it than what the United States government used the first time it sent a, you know, spaceship in, you know, uh, in, in, into outer space. That's how far we have come. And the scientists are absolutely convinced. And I'm not talking about some mad scientists or, or kooks. I'm talking about some of the greatest minds, you know, in the history of mankind. I'm talking about people such as Michio Kaku, you know, transhumanists, futurists like Ray Kurzweil, Jason Silva, and so many others out there. They're convinced that by 2035, we will have, for the first time, successfully transferred one's personality to an avatar, which is one of the reasons you have, the, you know, the, the, the film Avatar. This is, you know, they call this period the epoch of cybernetic immortality, the beginning of that period. <laughs> Literally, in one generation, bodies made of nanorobots will take shape or rise alongside hologram bodies. And by 2045, that's in one generation, we will see drastic changes in the very, you know, structure of society. They're talking about, you know, dawn of a new era, the era of neo-humanity. 2045 to today, that's like 30 years is if you go back, you know, to the collapse of the Soviet Union back in the 1990s, that's like 25 years ago. We're almost there. Just think how quickly this period has gone by. So when you actually get to this period, 2040, 2045, you're talking about the rise of this completely new concept of a human being where the idea of transhumanists is to incrementally first move the human mind into more disembodied, and no better way to say it, I guess, futuristic vehicles. So first you have a humanoid robot controlled entirely by a human brain via brain machine interface. Then you have a a, a conscious uh, a human brain transplanted into a humanoid robot. And then finally consciousness itself uploaded to a computer and finally a hologram that contains a full 
conscious human mind. I don't think they're going to get there because I think, you know, uh, I, what, the, what separates us from animals is this divine spark of reason, you know, which, which allows us to, uh, uh, to discover universal principles of nature and also improve the lives of everybody on the planet per square kilometer of space against the planet Earth and against nature or the universe. And so this is what transhumanists who literally believe that today they have the power of God and if they had to face God, they'd beat him, you know, <laughs> they're convinced right. that they actually have the technology to actually, you know, uncover the, you know, and discover and, and create, you know, or upload, you know, our consciousness onto an avatar of our choosing. Is, it, is there a hatred against Uh, nature and the natural order of things deep within this, do you think, deep within this philosophy, ideology? I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's hatred. I think it's, it's a natural evolution or progression of things. Transhumanism is this ultra high tech dream of computer scientists, philosophers, neuroscientists, and, you know, futurists and so many others. And the idea is that they seek to use radical advances in technology to augment First, the human body, then the mind, and ultimately the entire human experience. Now, to most people, you know, who listen to the show, and although I know that, you know, your show has some very, very, uh, uh, you know, experienced uh, uh, listeners, but still, the idea of this kind of technological advancement may sound like something from some, you know, science fiction film, but people are just not aware of constant breakthroughs in technology, which means that, you know, the... the uh, Transhumanist vision, a very real possibility for the near future. I, yeah. you know, I can give you tons of examples. You know, take neurochip interfaces, computer chips that connect directly to the brain. That's being developed as we speak. And the ultimate goal, of course, you know, is, is to increase intelligence thousands of times over, basically turning your brain into a supercomputer. I mean, I mean you know, again, if it's used wisely, that could be an amazing thing because, you know, you could download you know, the contents of, of, you know, a dictionary or your Encyclopedia Britannica in about one-tenth of one second. Yeah. You know, you say, wow, you know, or you can take, you know, as you would do with a pen drive, you know, you need a big pen drive, obviously, you know, an external drive. You could download everything that's out on Google, you know, in a couple of hours. But the point is, uh, again, how is this going to be used? The way the transhumanists understand it and the way that they lead the globalists and call them whatever you want is – You know, lifelong emotional well-being is a very important concept for the transhumanists. And they can achieve this through a recalibration of the pleasure centers in the brain. So, for example, pharmaceutical mood renders have been suggested. Right. <laughs> which would be cleaner and safer than the mind-altering drugs. I mean, go back to the 60s. Do you want this, you know, filthy, dirty hippies running around, you know, with these mind-altering drugs? No, they're difficult to control. Much easier pharmaceutical mood renders. But... If you look at it in perspective, this is Huxley's 21st century scientific dictatorship without yeah. tears. Yeah. Except that if you look at all these concepts, and again, this is not science fiction. This is reality. And all you need to do is just look what's out there and how these technologies are literally being integrated with human beings, combined with what these people call singularity. Again, the combination of technology and biology with, you know, the human beings. The idea of the singularity, the technological singularity, the big, one of the big components within this is, of course, artificial intelligence, that in some way the, the understanding, as far as I see it, is that we are not yet capable of, 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 of pulling this off in a way. We need help from a, a synthetic or a, uh, an, an engineer intelligence, which is far, far more intelligent than we are. So we put our faith or, or within the singularity movement, they put their faith in an, an external intelligence that's going to kind of come along and solve some of these issues for us that we have, have yet to crack. And then hopefully that intelligence is also going to take us part of us, you know, us in, in that process. But as we've seen in a number of, you know, dystopian movies and, and play, ample of warnings out there in the, in novels and everything else, There is this real chance, and even this, you know, Kurt Zweil and some of these people have been talking about this themselves, that this very entity that we are building and creating might actually turn on us. What, what do you think the possibility of that is? Oh, there is no doubt about that. I mean, you just touched on a very interesting subject. Look, uh, we can talk about singularity, we can talk about hive mind, we can talk about neuroscience. 
or we can talk about nanotech, all of this stuff combines to answer your question. For example, neuroscience, that's the study of the nervous system, except that with the advances in chemistry, computer science, engineering, medicine, okay, neuroscience now also includes the study of the molecular, cellular, develop, developmental, structural, functional, evolutionary, computational, and also medical aspects of the nervous system. So for the molecular and cellular studies of individual nerve cells to imaging of sensory and motor tasks in the brain, neuroscience has literally crossed the threshold on science and has become a key element of national security apparatus the world over. So if you want to talk about, you know, the meaning of neural weapons and the creation of perpetual state of uncertainty, you're looking at it right now. But again, emotional detection systems, needless to say, will form part of, uh, you know, this whole thing of, of, uh, of neuroscience. But, you know, and, and to go back to the, uh, you know, the idea of singularity, you know, these people are convinced from anything from, you know, cyborgs with very long lifespans to downloading consciousness onto a computer. Transhumanists, they don't know what the world is going to look like. You know, no. they can't do some of these things right now, but their lofty promises are needless to say being, you know, embraced by many people, okay, in very important people. And the idea of, again, transhumanism, singularity, is to create, you know, what they call popularly hive mind, which basically refers to the giant collective intelligence that might be created when people all over the world, the 7 billion people out there, link their brains together with technology. People say, this guy is nuts, this doesn't exist. Well, it does exist today, except instead of being called hive mind, it's called cloud, right? Yeah, yeah. That's what cloud is, except instead of you know, uploading our brains, we upload our files. But that's just the initial step to get everybody used to you know, the concept of hive mind. Sure. This is the template for post-humanity, the ultimate slave race, scientifically designed to never rebel, and the wholesale disappearance of the human being with his and her divine spark of reason at the expense of group speak, group think, and needless to say, group actions. Yeah. And on top of this, then, I would definitely say that there's another element of just a, a basic, um, you know, propaganda level of, of how this is being pushed today. We can even see, I mean, it's kind of a joke in a way, but they've they've talked about what Apple did and what Steve Jobs did as literally as a creation of a new religion. He built these, you know, glass cathedrals around the globe. It's even been um, someone actually did the calculation that showed that more people actually showed up to the Apple main building in New York as opposed to some of the old cathedrals. It's the you know Apple Topia. It's the building of this new uh, the Church of Progress, if you will. It's it's a new religion, and also on top of it, then it is a kind of fantasy. Well you know, we'll be immortal, we can just, you know, push the button and we'll receive whatever we want. And these are kind of the promises of what this is to offer. But as you say, there's much more, there's a shadow side <laughs> to this as well, right? Well, the shadow side is that, uh, you know, these technologies, if they're, you know, being developed to help humanity, it's an amazing thing because we need tech. Uh, you know, uh, I think one of the things about this book, it's, you know, it's been somewhat polarizing as far as, you know, the readers are concerned because some are saying, you know, Estel is promoting transhumanism. You know, he loves it. He's one of them. He's a traitor. <laughs> and others are saying, uh, you know, he's anti-tech. You know, he wants to kill us off like the Rockefellers do. No, I'm absolutely pro-technology. Technology is an amazing thing. It's what we do and how we use it. That's where the problem begins. So, again, you know, the, the, the technology is being developed today. If they're there to help mankind, that's an amazing, you know, development. But these technologies are not being developed, you know, to help mankind nor are they being developed to stop the terrorists, okay, as we, you know, are being repeatedly told with all the NSA tech and stuff. They're being developed to stop us, the people, and the laws to justify these technologies. We're not written on a whim. They're specifically designed to give the government carte blanche authority over the people during the chaos and confusion of the period that they call the age of transition, yeah. transition to a planetary civilization. Yeah, it, it's it's really it, it's really a, a, a dirty you know way that they've gone about this in terms of 
you know, developing this for the re for the purposes of, of of controlling mankind. And what do you think will happen to some of the people that would potentially be on the outside of this? We we can talk a little bit about some of the vulnerabilities in in a system like this as they're building it and, and as the potential threats to its arise as well. But the pressure, I believe, would be put on potential parents, as you said before, that would want to leave their children outside of this. But the debate that's going to be going on is similar to today. You know, it's like if you would want to hold a child out of school, let's say, there would be a tremendous pressure of, you know, oh, you're abusing the child. This is, your, you know, you have to put them in school. You have to do the regular routine as everyone else does, right? So a similar kind of uh, attitude would, would develop that, you know, no, 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 what are you doing? Are you, trying to, are you not giving your child a brain implant? You're, you're holding them back, right? Well, I mean, I think it's obvious. And, uh, you know, one of the ways that's going to be done is, is, you know, using the social media and the pressure, so the social pressure, which is one of the things I discussed in the book, explaining how you know social media has, you know has become a weapon in this you know uh, a war against humanity. Exactly, and and is this something that's going to be turned more into a tool for the the centralized uh, you know the the hive mind as well? Because as I've seen it, Daniel, it, it seems like surveillance and 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 all the devices with the cameras and the microphones and everything that goes in there right now. Is literally the it's the the new the the sensory network of this either we can call it an artificial intelligence or the cloud or whatever we want to call it really but between the synaptic devices and those who can read brain waves and all these new developments that occur this is literally like the 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 sensory input the eyes and the ears and the and the feeling of of this being right that's what I'm seeing happening in a way you know uh, the uh, uh, you know again. Uh, it, it, in the very near future, whether the airports, you know, border crossings, street corners, from now on will be mind probed by this amazing new technology being developed by the Human Factors Division of the Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology Directorate. And, you know, it's, 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 it's unavoidable that this technology is, is absolutely intrusive. But the point is, again, this stuff, okay, these, uh, uh, these are not publicly funded projects for the betterment of humanity. They're mostly secret experiments sanctioned in the name of defense, which when you put it on its head is crime prevention and extrapolated into the future is tailor-made to put down any rebellion by the 99% of the world's population destined to live in abject poverty in crime-infested megacities of the future, as the Strategic Trends Report discusses way back when in the year 2005. Now... Before we talk a little bit more uh, about potentially what, what what might be able to be done about this, if we're indeed are at the time of a, a fork in, in the road, if you will, if there's something we could yet to do to, to prevent this from coming into full, full force, uh, do, do you speculate that they are further ahead than they actually say that they are? Do you, do you, I mean, again, it, there really is no reason for us to sit and speculate what they have because or what we what we haven't seen that they have because what we know that they have is is extraordinary already. Nonetheless, though, there, where do you think the level of experimentation in, is, is at and how much do you think they've actually have developed when it comes to, you know, synthetic organisms or, or even a, a, a separate life form that would, you know, <laughs> we, would, we could mistake them for a human if we walked past them, but they would be everything but, you know, do you think they've developed some of these things already? I don't have any doubts that they're certainly in the process of doing it. A lot of the stuff is already out there, you know, in, in articles and, and experimental phases. But, you know, we can actually look at something a lot more concrete. For example, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, three and a half years from now, when we actually go to, uh, you know, in 2018, uh, the Dutch uh, private co company, Mars One, will be sending a, a manned mission to Mars. And by the year 2023, the Russians and the European Space Agency will be doing exactly the same thing. They'll be going to Mars. So we're talking about a one-way trip, one-way trip to Mars. And that's amazing if you actually think about it. These people are not coming back ever again. And the point is that, you know, these, the corporations and the governments are working now towards these amazing technologies. You know, private funded corporations such as Planetary Resources and Golden Spy Company are working around the clock on a landing mission to the moon and the mission critical projects of asteroid mining. This is amazing stuff if you think about it. But again, going back to the Strategic Trends Report, okay, this is what it says. By the year 2050, we are going to power ships that go in significant numbers with people in them to Mars. 
Now think again, 2040, 2045, the idea of being able to upload or download your consciousness onto a computer. 2050, five years later, we're going to be going in significant numbers to Mars. That's right. So the point is that the elite, they're planning at least a limited exodus from the planet Earth. Now my question is, what is it that they know that we don't? Nuclear wars, nano wars, bacteriological wars. I mean, they would know. They're organizing, you know, all this kind of stuff. And they're also organized to operate over and above societies. So there's a lot of, again, uncertainty and uh, uh, questions which uh, make you wonder about the future of humanity. Well, indeed. And one thing I've noticed, too, though, at the same time on top of this is certainly it's extraordinary what we know, but we still don't know how to create any of the, let's say, biological components or, or the genetic, you know, material. When, when people like, you know, J. Craig Venter, who's been called the Prometheus of Maryland, when he when he creates these synthetic organisms, he, he basically is playing Lego to a certain extent. I mean, I'm not saying that what they know is not, you know, you know, uh, extraordinary in that regard. But nonetheless, at this point, they're they're just building with the blocks that nature provided and, and putting them together and kind of combining them. So there, it's still not a, a full 100% control of, 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 of producing all of this material and, and exactly in the way that they want it to. Do you think that they'll get to that stage as well? Where, I don't have any doubts about that. Yeah. Of course they will. I mean, again, look, think how far we have come in 50 years. 20 years ago, okay, we didn't have internet. And 25 years ago, if somebody said to you that you and I could talk over a computer... Okay, you being in Sweden or wherever you are, and I being here, or I can, you know, have my cell phone in the middle of an Amazon rainforest and sit in a tree with the monkeys and actually surf and see the weather in Stockholm. They would put me in a psychiatric ward, tie me to a bed, you know, <laughs> give me, some, you know, some 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 nice little pills and your shock therapy. Right. And you know it's true. But the point is, this is natural and unnecessary development. I don't believe in God. You know, I don't know if God exists the way people say God exists. I have no idea. No one does. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. When, you know, when I was with Castro in 2010, I said to him, Comandante, how do you understand immortality? And he said to me, uh, he started talking to me about Karl Marx and, you know, and I, I you know, <laughs> and, you know, I did everything in my power not to laugh because it was just so goddamn silly yeah. you know what I mean? and he kind of, you know because you know, it was like me and him and and you know and behind us about 20 of cuba's most important journalists you know taking everything down you know so i didn't think laughing was you know was cool i didn't want to be thrown in jail and you know and he's a nice guy I like costume you know it was, it was fun it was fun being with him but the point is is that you know he kind of realized that what he was saying didn't make a lot of sense so he stopped and he said to me well how do you understand and i said Commandante, there's a lot of people, you know, who say that, uh, you know, immortality is, you know, you cross yourself 300 times a day and when a balcony falls in your head, you know, you die and your soul goes to heaven. I said, I don't know. It may be the case. You know, no one ever came back and told me that's how it works. But I can tell you that the whole concept of immortality for me is the idea to sure the survival of the human species. And for us to survive as a species, we need to be able to create these Legos and play because that's what it's all about. You know, we are curious by nature. That's how we discover universal principles of nature. And even those people who believe in God. And I gave a speech in the Vatican a couple of years back and they loved my speech, you know, all, all, you know, all these cardinals, because I said to them, you know, you know, I don't believe in God, but the point is, is that, you know, don't crucify me for that. But what I believe is that if you believe in God, and God created the universe, then also God gave us the capacity, mental capacity, to discover everything that he created because all of it works for the betterment of humanity. So I think we need to discover universal principles of nature because it's our calling as human beings. That's what makes us immortal. That's what gives us, you know, the idea of living for something for the future. The idea of as we're dying, you know, uh, we pass off the baton to the next generation. And that's what immortality is all about. So yes, my, the answer to your question is absolutely we're going to get there much sooner than later. But again, it depends on what we're going to do with this and how we're going to use this against the human race.
Well, exactly. A very, very good point. I want to take a short break here in a little bit, and, and then we'll talk more about some of the potential things that that, that could be done now and uh, in regards to even going to that in the book, of course, but nonetheless uh, outside of the uh, realm of, of uh, what we know and speculate a little bit about how we could thwart this or, or potentially, you know, kind of bend it in the right direction, if you will. But uh, just a quick note in regards to what you said about Castro there, though, in all fairness, Karl Marx kind of looks like a man kind of has depicted Yahweh for about a thousand years now, so that would be an, an easy mistake to make, I guess. <laughs> but none, and nonetheless, Daniel, let's let's give out some websites and stuff here. Where can people pick up a copy of the book if they want to read more? And what's your your website? Uh, my website is danielastulin.com. You can pick up the book. Probably the easiest, especially for the international audience, is Amazon. Amazon.com. You can go to Barnes and Noble, but you can go to my my publisher's uh, website, Trying Day. T R I N E. D A Y trying day.com. My publisher is uh, in uh, in Oregon, Portland, Oregon, and a uh, great man by the name of Chris Milligan. And uh, this book is uh, it, uh, it was released in Spain three months ago and uh, it went to number one, I think, in the first week. And uh, it's still number one in uh, in uh, in most uh, in most countries where it's been published. And now it just came out in the United States. And I think the reaction has been you know, is uh, awe inspiring in a sense that. People are saying that you know it's it's suddenly uh, all of these elements which we've seen and you know it's part of the you know uh, uh, you know futuristic lore and now actually somebody explains how all of these elements fit into this globalist agenda of control. Very good. Uh, Trinday.com, DanielEstelin.com, and we'll have the links up uh, to Amazon.com. Stay with us, uh, Daniel. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back with more. As we proceed in the second hour, we'll get into nanobots drones and modern warfare. Daniel says that the nanotechnological revolution is about to take humans to a completely new dimension. He'll also talk about food as a weapon, infertility, cradle-to-grave healthcare, and the depopulation agenda. We'll philosophize on why mankind is turning their backs on their natural selves and the natural world. So what does it mean to be human? Proceed to listen to our second hour at Red Eyes members.com subscribe if you haven't already and you can stream or download any of our previous programs we have uh, well over 800 shows on uh, all kinds of interesting important and of course controversial topics take a look around in our archive and i think you'll find something that will pique your interest and something you want to learn more about we'll return with more here in just a few days we have upcoming ulla damagord david ike brian forster with la marzuli marty leeds and uh, also yuri geller that shall be interesting. Don't miss it. Also, Radio 314 with Lana. Her next guest is Ben Shapiro. Don't uh, miss that one. Tune in whenever it works for you at RedEyesCreations.com and RedEyesMembers.com for the full broadcast. Thank you for listening. More with Daniel Estelin is coming up after the break, so stay with us.